Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. Let's get ready to rumble. Rumble. That's not from a movie, Gary. No. What's that from? That is from Ed, I'm not Ed McMahon, with you. isn't it? Oh, wow. Yeah. Is it? Vince, Vince McMahon. McMahon. I Vince think McMahon, Vin- thank you. Ed McMahon, I think. Does is. Vince McMahon do the PA? Annou- does he do the announcements overhead, though? I know he runs, he ran WWE, but did he do the announcements like at the beginning of every match? Not anymore. No. Oh, I, think I, it, I think the, the announcer was like Warren Buffer or something. Warren Buffer. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That, that would be that would be weird if the guy that that would be fun if the if the guy that actually owned the he was a commissioner of the league mm-hmm. and he also did the introductions for every match. Yeah, that'd be a I lot would, of work. I would though. find that to be pretty entertaining. Uh, hey, everybody! Welcome back to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. Uh, I'm your host Johnny Blackburn. Alongside me, as always, is Gary Elmore. Gary, welcome back. Thank you. Good to be back. Glad you could actually uh, uh, make it today. Um, since I know this is such a trek from your bedroom to the kitchen, it is. It's, it's a long trek. Yeah. Yeah, I know it is. Uh, we are. We we are very grateful today to have on the largest number of participants in any film debate we've ever had here on I Don't Give a Flick. We got four people on. We're also joined by uh, screenwriter and director and one of our other producers here at Leadfeather Productions, Neil Riley. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you. So glad to be here. And also coming back for an encore because so many of you guys requested it. Uh, just kidding. No one requested it. I don't know how he got an invite back to the show, but from the podcast, Reese and Jacob versus Evil, Jacob Johnson back again. Jacob, hello. Die. No, go go to hell. That's, I, I don't. That's true. Okay. Hey, what's the name of this podcast again? Uh, I don't remember. What is the name of the podcast, Gary? Uh, I believe it's I Don't Give a Flick. I Don't Give a Flick, just yes. like I Don't Give a Flick about Jacob's life at all. Wow. Uh, hey, jokes on you. Anyways, New you know, I. Great. Okay, that's just sad and pathetic. Anyways, you're boring, so I'm going to go to Neil, because he's more interesting. Uh, Neil, Neil, how you doing? Neil Riley. <laughs> yeah, right? uh, of Riley Rally Racing Of fame, Riley I Rally believe. Racing yes. and I'm Leadfeather glad you Productions. Got to put that plug in there for Riley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Do you think they'd sponsor us? Yeah. All, all of your rally needs can be handled by Riley Rally Racing. <laughs> and what's great is Riley Rally Racing is currently sponsored by Rev in Austin, Texas. Yes, Revs Automotive in Austin, Texas. Are we just going to sound clip every business that we all own? Keep the money moving. <laughs> Keep the money moving. I don't know how the economy works, okay? Uh, That's okay. Just, it's how, not do you, how do you launder money? <laughs> uh, Neil, give everybody, uh, give all the listeners a little bit of background about yourself, uh, film experience, just who you are, what you love, and what you desire in life. Well, uh, I've been a fan of the movies, uh, you know, my entire life. I've dedicated the last 10 years both stage productions and film productions. Um, I recently journeyed into the world of writing, uh, directing, and as you know, led by the productions and some other productions around the city of Austin. Perfection. And so, so this is a perfect episode for you to make your debut on because this literally ties into the screenwriting aspect yes. of, of yeah. what you're already what you're already an expert on. Um, so, but why Jacob is here. He's not a screenwriter. He's not a screenwriter. No one likes his face. He doesn't even like his own face. Oh, oh, no. and and he's he's just not fun. He's not an entertaining I, person. I, I don't know why nobody likes to work with us. We're so nice to them. <laughs> we are. We're nice to Neil. Neil, we've been nice to you since the start of this, right? Oh, you've been great to me. See, Neil's fantastic. I love Neil. I love Neil like a brother. Jacob, I love like a lover, a step cousin. I, I love that, the abuse because it makes me feel like I'm needed. <laughs> well, if we don't have you, we turn on each other. That's right. just how it works. So, so. speaking of needed abuse, uh, today's episode is about antagonists. So oh, that is antagonizing. Yes, I know. Um, so the antagonist is uh, any person or force in a story which the protagonist, which is typically known as the hero, works against. Typically and typically. So th- and this and this we'll get into this portion of the debate in a, in a couple in a couple minutes. But we do want to be clear, just for those of you that are thinking in your head, okay, my favorite antagonist of all time. Oh, what pops out? Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter, Darth Vader, the Joker, things like that. The antagonist does not necessarily have to be a villain. Okay, the villain is a character, and the antagonist is a it's a plot point. You know, it's 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 their their actions and what they say it veers the protagonist to certain situations throughout the story. So just just to make that clear. Now, granted, a lot of films and a lot of stories over the last. 
I mean, hell, over the last couple you know, centuries and yeah. millennium. Yeah, exactly. Ever since humanity was around. Since really. the beginning <laughs> of storytelling. Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, so let's let's just dive let's just dive right into this. And Neil, since you're since you're the the newcomer under the block for this first week, let's let's get your input first. What to you makes a good antagonist, whether it be a villain or an event or or whatever it is? What what makes it enticing for you that that portion? I mean, obviously, uh, it plays a key part in the story. I enjoy the fact that the hero of the story typically, you know, always has to overcome some kind of challenge. I typically prefer antagonists that aren't people. I enjoy, uh, like, the Martian because distance or the planet itself is the antagonist that the hero has to overcome. Right. Uh, but uh, but for me, uh, you, you really just can't have a story without the central problem. Right, of the, of the antagonist, right? Correct. Yeah, no, no one, I mean, let's face it, no one's going to watch a movie based on any one of our lives throughout the day, most likely. You know, it's like, oh, we woke up, went to work, came home, and ate it, dinner. Isn't that pretty much Seinfeld? That's, no, and that's a show about nothing. nothing. <laughs> that's a show about nothing. Come on, Gary. Like, you've seen it a million times. Oh, you got to okay. be kidding me. <laughs> so I, I guess uh, as we start off this episode, I'd like to uh, go over the five types of antagonists that you can have in literature. Um, so... First off, you have the an, the antagonist of man versus self, um, and this is what is psychological thrillers genre you would see having this a lot, P possibly, or it could be um, a, a guy that has to struggle with an internal problem. So, like, it be a drama then, uh, yeah, um, like an addiction, or if you think of American Psycho, it was really him <laughs> fighting against his own inner demons. So that's sort of the internal man versus self. I conflict. still don't know if he if he did that or not. We don't know. Yeah, we, we could have a whole debate on whether Patrick Bateman actually, actually killed tried, all those people or yeah, not. Yeah. Tried to feed a cat to a, a ATM an machine. ATM machine. <laughs> and then you have man versus man, um, which is a real common type because that's a um, the hero versus another person, um, and it could be a villain. Mm -hmm. um, so Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. You know, right. that's man versus man. And then you have man versus nature, which is. Uh, a human being being at odds with some force of nature. So if you think about um, the so Martian, like would, Neil just said, yeah, the Martian, like, yeah. like Neil said in the Martian or Castaway, um, that's, that's man versus nature. Wilson. Yeah, and then you have man versus society, um, which is a the the hero struggling against uh, the norms of the society in which they live. So you could think of. Uh, Probably a lot of political uh, films. A lot of political, yeah, uh, Amazing Grace, um, mm -hmm. where he was struggling, uh, the English guy in Parliament uh, trying to overturn slavery. In, yeah, uh, Ian Gruber's England. character. Yeah. Fahrenheit um, 451. Yeah. Fahrenheit 451. Fahrenheit. Would you throw, like, Schindler's List in there? Uh, That'd yeah. be a combo, actually. I think you could do it because you have the Nazis on one hand, and then you've got the current World War II situation on the other hand. Yeah. So, yeah, you could probably throw that in there, I'd say. Um, There's a lot of good mixes. Yeah, and, and then the last one is man versus fate. So that would be man versus God, also known as. Um, and that's just a person struggling against uh, what is determined for to happen to him mm -hmm. and trying to overcome that. And you see that a lot in classical literature, such as mm -hmm. um, uh, Oedipus, um, where uh, he was fated to do what happened to him. And so those five types of conflicts set up the... Uh, antagonist can play as the antagonist one or more of them for the protagonist to react off of okay so it's interesting that you bring up the that you bring up oedipus rex so if that's the case then please don't say that johnny <laughs> <How> do <you? laughs> macbeth macbeth <laughs> macbeth um how do you know good luck Just thank you know thank you luck. um how do you how do you determine between if it's man versus fate or it's man versus man? Because you bring up something like Oedipus, and yes, it is man versus fate, but he is also he is also um, he fights he fights his own father, and he fights um, God. He doesn't fight with his mother. Um, there's somebody else. It's been so long since I've read the play. There's something else but, with his mother that starts with an F. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in in something in something like that, there are there's subplots. There's there's subtext of mm -hmm. those. So really, it you know it, it leads you to believe you know is is the overarching theme 
the man versus fate or is it man versus man because he's actually interacting with those people on a day to day basis and what they say to him and their actions will dictate how he moves forward. So, right. Yeah. So it, it just kind of depends where the um, focus of the story is. So if it's something where the it's a supernatural event pulling him towards something that he can't get out of, mm-hmm. then that's more of a man versus fate. Whereas okay. if it's, you know, something that's not predetermined and you're moving along the course of your day and you encounter, a, you know, a man versus man scenario, that's, you know, not generally considered man versus fate, okay. but they just like with any, uh, like, like genre or literature, there's always some blurring of the lines when sure. you get down to the nitty gritty of it. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, no, that's, I'm, I'm glad we were able to clarify that at the beginning because what we're about to go into, we, we will have to pick sides. Uh, so Jacob, same question I posed to Neil posing to you, what to you makes an enticing antagonist? Like, what do you think makes the best antagonist for you in a story? Not even just a film. Uh, usually somebody who can match the inte- the protagonist in sort of the opposite manners. Uh, usually the darker side, they uh, kind of represent like the fears they're trying to overcome, uh, the mm-hmm. obstacles that they need to face. Uh, they're just kind of the darker aspect of who the main character is. Sometimes it might just be like uh, an immovable object they need to overcome. Um, like like uh, Neil was talking about, I like he loves... Um, antagonists that aren't humans usually like same with me i love my monsters and i like it when the monsters are Hmm. more of the nature aspect you know godzilla stuff like that Uh, so it's always fun to see how man can overcome the thing that was like basically brought them to life how can man defeat god in a sense or the earth uh something that's just impossible to overcome really um but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day they do overcome it and it's fun to watch them overcome it in some regards while others uh, you kind of revel in the fact that they can't beat the villain, and I do like those as a lot as well. Okay. Interesting, though. Yeah. So you prefer the man versus nature, it sounds like, from from what you were saying. Ultimately, yes, but though a lot of the picks I have today were more on the man side of things, cause, okay. mostly because I, I don't want to just keep like going to my monsters like every single time I hop on this podcast. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Well, <laughs> you're the monster guy, though. Yeah. That's what you're known for. So one, one of the things... One of the things I I think is interesting is human beings have been telling stories for millennia. And really, when you get down to it, you can't really have a story that falls out of those, you know, five antagonists when you tell a a story, especially if it's a a classically written story. Um, You know, you've always got, you know, maybe it's um, in... 10,000 BC where the guy's got to go kill a, a saber tooth or something. Mm. It's been a while since I've seen that movie. Um, <laughs> or not the best movie. Right. <laughs> or year one for the more comedic version of it. Um, you know, it was not historically accurate. No, at all. no, it was not, not, not in the slightest, <laughs> but you throughout humanity on all the stories we tell, the antagonist is always, you know, one of those elements. And I, I think that's, Right. That speaks to the eternal truism of storytelling, you know, that those remain the the way to tell a story. I, I, yeah, I think for me and I know I, I would agree, but I, I, th- I think for me personally, I really enjoy I really enjoy seeing the protagonist being on a large team of people. So like you know, what you guys are referring to, the Martian or the day the Earth stood still or. And, and any any basically any saving with Private Ryan d- yeah yeah oh yeah that's a, that's a well, horrible he a, example he, he had a team he did he did but I'm I'm referring to you know man man versus animal man versus demon oh, man okay. versus you know um, those ones are great because you get to you know you root for yourself you're like that's that's my race mm-hmm. like that's my that's what I am it's my species um, but I have to say that to this day there's not there's nothing quite like for me, man versus man to build up the intensity and to build up the anticipation for what's going to happen next, because it, oh God, I don't, I don't even know what it is. You know, it's, it's just like when a good villain is created, um, you typically want to have a villain that, not just an antagonist, but a villain that is equal to or more powerful in some way, shape or form than the hero. Mm-hmm. You want them to be, they want to, they need to have some, empathy towards something you know whether it's like Hannibal Lecter had Clary Starling that he was like he would kill everybody else he'd eat everybody's 
fucking face or whatever, you know, eat their hearts or whatever, but he wouldn't touch Clarice, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, you look at the same thing. It's you know, with with Darth Vader. You know, it's like he he in the end would not kill his own son. You right. know, and and so there needs to be some type of humanizing, redeeming quality mm -hmm. to that villain. Um, but I I don't know. I like the juxtaposition between the two, where they're they're fighting for your love back and forth. And even though they're they're evil, mm -hmm. they're not. They're they're still human, right? You know, you know and even if they're not human, they're they're still human qualities to them. Like, right. Because. Right. When you talk about Darth Vader and Star Wars, that's an interesting one because Luke has sort of a man versus man with his father, mm -hmm. but his father has a man, man versus, versus self, self right? with, you know, his own decision. So you you can really start layering the antagonists in a, in a really well-crafted story to, to really make it interesting. And I think before we start getting into the specifics of all the movies we kind of want to talk about, I, I just want to also say, like, you can't really have a good protagonist if you don't have a really good antagonist and that doesn't oh, have absolutely. to be that doesn't have to be a person uh, it could just be an idea or a society that people are working against or an event that's going to happen but if you don't have a strong good antagonist your protagonist can't rise to meet them and they'll always be just you know not the not the hero that we need them to be. And are I, you I trying think to? Are you trying to say that Sylvester Stallone would not have been the same antagonist if he fought Woody Allen instead of Dolph Lundgren? Is that what you're trying to uh, say? Th that is what I'm saying. Although I would have <laughs> loved to have seen that cut. I, I was going to say even you. more of the people's hero these days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. Just yeah, you're right, Neil. If if there wasn't a strong uh, antagonist against Rocky Balboa, you know, uh, then that wouldn't have been something to overcome. That would have been the same kind of hurdle. And I think that like, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be a hurdle that we ourselves might find difficult. Um, but you know, if you like, you know, chariots of fire, you know, that's, uh, the hurdle in, in that story, uh, you know, was him overcoming, you know, what he, the best he could do or, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think that a lot of movies and that have been made recently, they're not as good in a lot of ways because they crappen or cheapen the antagonist force, whatever that force is, they either a, you know, they make it all evil. So, you know, like Johnny was saying, he likes to be able to root for both sides because, you know, to be empathetic towards both sides, they either dumb it down, you know, or, or make them make stupid choices all the time. And when you have a protagonist battling an antagonist that's making stupid choices all the time, it makes the protagonist much less heroic is what I had to say about that. I agree. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, I, I. I, I would I would agree, obviously, with the generalized statement itself. Um, but you're saying within the last decade, there Hollywood's done a poor job of writing their antagonists. Currently, they're just goofy imbeciles who trip over the. They've got two left feet and they trip over themselves. Yeah, I, I think overall character writing in Hollywood has become much more two dimensional. Uh, there are some notable exceptions, which I think we will talk about. But I, I think overall, um, with movies, they have become a lot more simplified in that manner. I, I would. <sighs> It's, it's hard because I want to disagree with you right. because that's just the nature of the show and the nature of me. Yeah. But you're very disagreeable, Johnny. <laughs> you know, it, it, no, it, I mean, it, it's, it's hard. You know, I mean, you look at, I mean, the one argument I would, I would pose to you is you look at the Marvel series in particular, right. and I don't want to go, I, I didn't want to go the hero route because I was like, oh, it's so mainstream. Everybody fucking knows about it, but it's a good example. And it's, it's, it's solid. Like you look at Thanos. Mm -hmm. Okay. You look, uh, and we had talked about this earlier. You said he Thanos is was the ultimate hero. I mean, those protagonists, <laughs> the Avengers, I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I would also like to point out that, so Thanos, this is a complete digression from the discussion we're having here, but Thanos snaps his fingers and half of the population and living creatures disappear. And then, uh, the, for five years and then they bring them back. Um, you right. know what kind of mass starvation and misery would happen to all the people and creatures on Earth since there hasn't been farming for enough people? Exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's really, it's it was, a horrible decision. Yes, it was terribly cruel. <laughs> terribly cruel. But that's never talked about. I mean, they completely <laughs> skipped over it in Spider Man, really. 
Yeah, yeah. They, they did. Yeah, they, they, nobody said anything. Yeah. I don't... There I mean, should be mass starvation, riots in the streets. I, I thought mean. they had mentioned in Spider-Man Far From Home, in the second one, yeah, about him like, this gone guy, for five years. Yeah, they, well, they did, but... In Endgame, they did mention that, like, the Earth has flourished, aside from humanity, right. Earth has flourished in... But sin- Nick in Fury the mentioned it, though. Thanos sn- mm-hmm. Right. But Nick Fury mentioned it at the at the end of um, Coming Home. I guess he was the only person. But Spider-Man also, to my, he, he also disappeared right. for five years. Yeah. And so you're right. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, no, no Jacob, you're right. I mean, yeah, they, they didn't mention it at all. He didn't, he didn't bring it up. I mean, it was just Nick Fury. Um, yeah, because basically his entire class for, uh, you know, his closest friends, MJ and, uh, and his buddy, yeah. all disappeared with him. So they don't really right. talk about that. Yeah, that was very yeah. convenient that all of his friends disappeared so they wouldn't have to, you know, r- try any right. complicated writing, <laughs> but whatever. So I, I guess go, going back towards this, though, um, and granted, over the last decade, there have obviously been tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of films released, not just in theaters, but just across the world within the last 10 years. But of those, you look at you look at Thanos, you look at Loki. Mm-hmm who just those two in general by themselves, I think are two of the better antagonistic villains that have ever been created for cinema because they do endear themselves to the audience. They, they find them a way to connect themselves to humanize, you know, like Loki, he's got the soft spot in the end. He has that soft spot for Thor that we all thought was there in the first couple of movies. And then we see it come out towards the end of Endgame, Um, and then we also see that, uh, towards his mother, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I mean, he, he, when he, he freaks out when she dies in, um, uh, uh, sorry, what was the third one? Thor, Ragnarok. Uh, not Ragnarok. That's the third. Uh, the second one. Um, I, Dark, Dark World. World. Dark World. Thank you. Yeah. And I know we don't normally talk about that one for good reasons. We should. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, a monster. And it? then Th- and Thanos is the same thing. You know, he he wants to obviously he wants to kill half of the world, but it's to save humanity. It's yeah. to save civilization. And now, while I don't agree with his methods, mm-hmm. you know, he wants to preserve life. I just think that the ideals he has are a little skewed and misguided, and I wouldn't necessarily go about yeah, it and, like that. Th- <laughs> Thanos is very interesting. Um, I guess we'll get into specific movies now. Um, because uh, <laughs> up until um, Infinity War... It, it was very interesting how Marvel did that because we really didn't know much of Thanos' motivations whatsoever. And then they took probably 40% of Infinity War and we just stayed with Thanos the entire time. Right. So we really got to, to learn about him and understand him. And I was... I, I think Infinity War was a better movie than Endgame. I thought they were both fantastic Agreed. movies, but I, I really, really enjoyed that aspect of Infinity War because we got to uh, get into Thanos' shoes and kind of see what he was doing and the reasoning behind it. And he wasn't sort of just this big power-hungry monster that most Marvel movies have as their uh, their antagonist. He you know, like he had a lot more depth to him, and I thought they really did a good job with that. They, it's nice when they actually show the backstory, or they try, you know, they try to connect them mm-hmm. to someone who's a lead character. You know, they did that with Gamora for him, uh, with Loki. Obviously, they did it with Thor and, and Odin. Um, and another one that I I really loved that, which and actually this will lead into my next point. But with with um, Thanos, you know, it's it's like Gary and I were talking about this uh, the other day, where this goes back to throughout history that in Western civilization, how where we're at today and how we've been educated in our school system and things like that, we're taught that these certain people are just plain evil and everything they did was just horrible and they're just born these monsters. And while some of them, I think there are obvious ones, are Yes, definitely like that. The majority of these people probably did not wake up every morning going, man, I wonder how I can be an asshole today. I wonder how many families I can rip apart and how much genocide I can th- cause upon my country. No, I, th- I think that most of them were just thinking of how to better their people, whether it be their their republic, their country, their city, their organization, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Now, granted, the ways they went about it, same thing with Thanos, you know, it's it's skewed, misguided to the the general populace right it's hurtful um but you know it's 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 i I go into my favorite one since we're already talking about specifics um if you guys have ever seen whiplash um jk simmons character where he plays terrence fletcher is this he's just he's this narcissistic 
complete jack off who is just a huge asshole. He's talented at his job. He, he directs the jazz band. It's like the number one jazz band in the entire country. Um, and he's constantly, I mean, he throws symbols at his kid's head. Um, he, the, the he musical really instrument in class. What the musical instrument symbols, a symbol. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he throws symbols and syllables at them. Yeah. Um, works them you know, until they bleed basically. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and it, for those of you that have, I have, have you guys seen the movie? Anybody? I have. You're yes. Seeing, okay. Um, okay. So, so you, so you know what I'm talking about where from his perspective to, to create that constant, consistent level of greatness and perfection, it demands sacrifice and basically manners and most ethics are thrown out the window because to reach that level, reach that tier, you have to just be vicious and you have to be cruel and you have to be brutal sometimes. And it's not the way I would go about it. It's effective. Uh, and he eventually gets his comeuppance, you know, and he eventually gets fired and that kind of stuff. Um, but you see that what humanized him with me, why I was kind of rooting for him at a certain point, why I loved his character so much. I mean, he was a dick to Miles Teller's character, but he he wanted the best for he wanted the best for the band. He wanted the best for the school. He wanted the best for his kids. And he pushed them so hard to reach that next level of greatness. Um, and. There's a lot of controversial figures, you know, uh, coaches in particular, mm -hmm. I'm sure music directors and directors on film sets as well, you know, um, even actors um, that get that kind of rap, you know, um, Edward Norton and Christian Bale, I know, get that kind of rap. They're always in the editing room when no one invited them. They're always in the director or the lead editor's ear being like, no, no, change this, do this, move this scene in front of that scene. I don't care what you think. Fucking do it. I know what I'm talking about. They're not coming in trying to be a dick they just want the best possible product to go out and that's that's the way they've chosen to go about it it's not the most amicable way of going about it they're not terribly affable yeah. people but it's a little antagonistic i would say <laughs> womp, womp. Womp, womp, womp. um so i mean yeah that, that that would be my favorite in the last he, I, mean, okay. I would say terrence fletcher i know that's kind of a a stretch you know um because he's not really a villain well he's, he's certainly the antagonist yeah. sure um so, Neil, what about you? Uh, what, who, who would you say is probably one of your favorite antagonists from the last decade, just from any film? doesn't matter. I mean, I think the way I look at it is I like to... Stories really have impacted me. And for me, I always liked the Back to the Future series. And I think it has a really no good antagonist. And it's not... I think Marty himself having to overcome being baited into fights, being called chicken. He has to learn how to grow in the series. And you see that. Mm -hmm. Like in the second one, you see how horrible his life had declined when he kept letting people dictate his actions. So I always enjoyed the story because I got to see Marty realizing, you know, the situations he's being put into, overcoming them, and really learning not to let other people dictate his life. So I think right. that was always, for me, a good story with a good antagonist was not, you know, a human biff, sure. but more of a self-conflict. Okay. Yeah. So the man, the man versus fate kind of thing, a man versus time, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be man you know, versus man, self, man versus guess. fate and man versus self. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Jacob, how about you? Uh, let's see. So mine was kind of more in the man versus society aspect. Like I absolutely sure. adore uh, the town of uh, Sea Haven Island in the Truman Show and Ed <laughs> Harris as uh, the yes. auteur Kristoff. Uh, just the the nature of that world is very you know sort of. Uh, it's fake and Truman is truly the only real person in there. And then just the, the things he has to go through to work through and uh, understand the world that with which he's given very much like the matrix or dark city, you know, it's like he's presented with a fake world and he's slowly working his way into uh, discovering what it truly is. Um, he's watching, he's even watching it fall apart around him. Like there's stage lights everywhere. Um, so if, if nobody's ever seen the Truman show, <clears throat> It's basically set up like a reality television show, and Truman uh, was born into the show itself from a very early age. He was adopted by Kristoff, uh, and I guess a television network of some sort. I don't remember the name of it, but yeah. uh, they basically he was picked in the womb, wasn't he? Do what? He was picked from the womb, right? I, like he was picked I like, right, so. right yeah. as he was birthed. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, they build an entire like 
uh, island and stage set in the middle of uh, LA, I believe, uh, and yeah. just keep him on this island by any means necessary, lying to him, telling him there's nothing outside of Sea Haven Island. It's like anytime he even asks, like, oh, I want to go to Tahiti. I want to go to Jamaica or something like that. They're like, uh, there's no point. Why would you ever want to go there? And then even um, people sneak onto the show to sort of like, you know, enlighten him, awaken him, you know, be the Morpheus to his Neo in a lot of ways. And so I love hmm. watching Truman work against that societal nature of that world with which he's given. And even Kristoff, uh, which is who's portrayed by Ed Harris, even gives like he acts like this, you know, gentle uh pompous self-absorbed auteur like he, he like he believes himself to be god i mean he even talks to truman like god through a microphone at the end of that film trying to tell him that well, like <clears throat> you belong in this world like you shouldn't go outside you know kind of adam and eve in the garden of eden don't go outside of it i made this world for you it's for you and you alone but truman just fights against it constantly because he wants to be he wants to you know, discover who he's supposed to be, what world there is outside of which, with what he's given. And I absolutely adore how that movie, um, sure shows you like, no matter how much society tries to push you down, you want to push back against it and overcome it and defeat it. Yeah. 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 I think, um, you, 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 there's a lot of elements of the, you know, what an antagonist is in that, um, cause you have, you know, sort of society, the society that built the whole idea behind reality TV shows and their popularity, which allowed this sort of stage to be built stage to be set, if you will. And, uh, the story progressed through Truman's, um, coming of age really, cause it's kind of a coming of age story. In a, yeah, it's in a very way. much. Yeah, because uh, even though he's a grown man, he's still adolescent in a lot of ways. He still acts like a child. He's even like this entire the entire movie is basically him fighting against his dad, uh, who is Kristoff. Basically, like it's him rebelling against that entire world. And uh, yeah, it's so. Right. Yeah. And as you said, sort of an Adam and Eve story in terms of leaving the Garden of Eden, um, the Garden of Eden, in this case, being the. Um, what was it, New Haven? Uh, no. Sea Haven Island. Sea Haven. New Haven's in Connecticut. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a fictitious town, Gary. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, definitely. That's, um, I, I think that's a, that's a really good pick. Uh, for myself, I, am, I would, I've been thinking about it, and I think that my favorite, maybe antagonist, I really do like Thanos, uh, but I, I think that I would go with... Um, it was a movie in the 90s called Crimson Tide. It had uh, Denzel Washington and, and Gene Hackman in it. Um, oh, and, shit. Yeah, and what I really like about that movie is Gene Hackman would be the antagonist of the movie, one of them, but he's also, what he's doing, you know, is right in a lot of ways, uh, just as Denzel Washington's character is right in a lot of ways. And so it's that conflict between two goods that really, I think, is where the, the you can really have beautiful, dramatic tension and come to understanding. It's the same th kind of thing with um, A Few Good Men, like Jack Nicholson's character. Um, he was the antagonist of that in many ways, but you can really see his perspective on why he was doing the things he was doing. So go going back to Crimson Tide, it was a movie about uh, a submarine crew, and they're patrolling the waters in the China Sea, and... They receive part of a coded message, but they're in the middle of a battle, and so their antenna breaks, so they can't get the rest of the message, and the message said to, like, fire a nuclear missile. And so Gene Hackman, who's sort of this older sea captain who's uh, gone through, like, a lot of the, the Soviet-era war, uh, the, the Cold War, that's what we call it, yes. That's what we call it in this country, is it not, comrade? <laughs> <laughs> um, he's like, we need to fire the missile. We got the order. We, you know, everything else, you know, the country could be destroyed, so we've got to fire the missile. Denzel Washington, who's um, a younger, uh, his XO, um, and he's like, we need to verify this before we, we fire the missile. So both of them do follow protocol, and both of them are correct in what they do, but you have that tension uh, that builds, and I think that, for me, is what, a, a really good antagonist does you know they make us question ourselves and make us really muddy the waters with who is the who is right and who is wrong yeah yeah that's a good pick 
Thank you. I try. Try harder. Oh, okay. Just kidding. That was pretty good. Um, Everyone's uh, jealous of me now. I just want to say I mean, that. That's true. I've <laughs> seen Crimson Tide since I was a kid, and now I really want to rewatch it. Uh, that's my movie recommendation for today. Crimson you Tide. You, we don't recommend movies as the host. We let people who are just coming on oh. recommend a movie. Somebody, uh, somebody recommend Crimson Tide. Then at the end of the show, I recommend <laughs> Crimson Tide. Thank you, thank you, Neil. You're welcome. You suck, Neil. I like Jacob now more than you. Oh, oh, oh no, that's a really low bar, man. <laughs> that's a low bar to set. Um. So I, I guess I guess the the other the other thing that we want to look at here too is the, obviously the the main qualities of an antagonist mm-hmm. are primarily yeah it's 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 what what person or event or whatever paranormal fate you know or fate or whatever it is call um, it fate call <laughs> it luck call it karma. No, mm. no, no musical mm. songs. We're, we're not that kind of podcast it's from anymore. Ghostbusters, is it? Yeah, yeah, man. I didn't recognize that at all. Oh my gosh! You call yourself yeah. a movie overrated buff? movie? Oh, 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 oh. listen, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just right. kidding. Next You're, podcast oh, I, is on I thought, Ghostbusters. I thought you were referring to the the Melissa McCarthy Ghostbusters. That's why I said overrated. Nobody rates that highly. <laughs> Nobody. Maybe I'm just trying to cover my own ass. Yeah. Um. No, so I mean, you know, yeah, past past all of that, the the generalizations of an antagonist. Um, what else do we? What else do we personally? What is your least? So out of those five that that Gary read, Gary, pull that list back up, will you? All right. Um, just so we have it uh, up in front of us here, real quick. What is everyone's least favorite? So we've got man versus self, man versus man, man versus nature, man versus society, and man versus fate. What would you guys say is your least favorite of those uh, to, to actually watch? What's what's what do you think is the most boring with the least interesting out of those five uh, to actually sit back and watch an entire movie based upon the, the struggle between the protagonist and these five options? I mean, it really depends on the story itself, because to me, I would say the Martian is <laughs> man versus nature he, planet. And to me, that was a very mm-hmm. enjoyable story. However, uh, I would also say to a stretch like Lord of the Flies is uh, man versus nature, them trying to survive on the island, but the story itself didn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. And also Lord of the Flies is also very man versus man because you have the kids turning against each other. Right. But I mean, that could also be as a result society of too, like, finding nature yeah, mm-hmm. and society. Yeah, I would pr- probably classify that as man versus society. In, uh, in Lord, Lord, of the Lord of the Flies. Okay, was, but so regardless, regardless of that of that portion, what what do you guys? Okay, so so for me personally, mm-hmm. I would say that probably, I mean honestly, with the exception of if you want to consider Fight Club or like Memento or something like that, where he's like fighting with you know, loss of memory or his alter ego or, or something like that. I would say man versus self for me personally. Really? Are, it's not, it's not that they are horrible movies. It's just that collectively out of the tens of thousands of movies I've seen over my entire lifetime so far, I would say that man versus self are typically not as exciting to watch for me. I'm not saying that I don't like those movies. I'm just saying that if I had to choose between, Man vs. Self and Man vs. Man, or I'd say my probably second favorite on there is 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 probably Man vs. Fate. I would I would pref- I would prefer to watch the the latter two. Okay, you know um, right. I just think the internal struggles that cause and you know me I love dramas I, I do it which I'm is starting a lot, to question which, that right now <laughs> which which Man vs. Self does fall into a lot. Um, I you know just just the person fighting his own demons. So you didn't like Goodfellas. Because that's all about I, a man fighting his demons. That's not a man fighting his demons. That's a subplot oh, of oh, Goodfellas. Okay, that is okay. no, no, no. Goodfellas, <laughs> are you joking me? Man, Goodfellas could be man versus man. Could also be man versus society. Okay, itself. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, I mean, and tag, I mean, hell, that Tommy's an antagonist in that. I mean, he's he's one of Ray Liotta's best friends, but 
a lot of the shit that he does sets them up to fail later on down mm. the line. Right. You know, um, at, a, at one point, Robert, De, um, uh, Jimmy Conway, Robert De Niro's character, same thing. You know, mm. he is good friends with him, but halfway through the movie becomes one of the main antagonists, you know, spoiler um, alert. Okay, if it came out in the early nineties, if, if you haven't seen it yet, then it's your own fault for yeah. not watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Highly overrated movie. Get the fuck out of here. Not as much as Ghostbusters, okay? Oh my or God. Mash. Oh. Mash. That, that that from? I, just, that I, just, from? I just know you and Neil love Mash a lot, and so I thought I'd. I'd, I'd I, I like the TV show shot. better than the movie, but yeah. <laughs> Okay. I never saw, I never saw the movie. Okay, so I can't enough. really say that. <laughs> That's unfair for me to say. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, man versus self would, you know, um, uh, a being, uh, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of dramas, you know, there's, oh God, uh, there was one in particular, uh, all things must go. It was Will Ferrell's first. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. It was 2010, 2011. Will Ferrell plays an alcoholic and his wife is leaving him. And he, right. And he's like selling the stuff off his front lawn right. to that little girl. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this, the idea of the movie wasn't bad and Will Ferrell actually did an okay job. Um, I just think that it was just so painstakingly mind numbingly boring to me mm-hmm. that he was going through this because not only is that such a real thing that happens to probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people over the course of society, I fucking myself have gone through something like that, mm-hmm. you know, um, all, all, not to a T, not being married and stuff, but I had that point in my life where I was just down on my luck and I'm not going to go too much into it because that could be a whole damn book. But it's it's just that thing. It's just it's not it's not something different. And so I like stories and antagonists and protagonists and character arcs of things that I've never experienced in my life. It has to be something new. I don't want to watch, uh, you know, I don't want to watch a, a ton of movies about, you know, alcohol and drug addiction or, um, you know, just other, other things that are just so realistic that I've encountered them before. Okay. It, it's just, it's not new for me. I like a story that wants to open my eyes to something I've never thought of perceiving before and broaden my horizons, see something new. Um, it's just, it's, it's just too close to home, so it's not it's not exciting. Okay. It's just boring. All right. So that's just me though. Man versus self is Johnny's least favorite antagonist. Still like a lot of those yeah, movies. Yeah, okay, just okay. out of the five. Okay. All I right. would have to pick that. So All right. Neil. Uh I mean for me versus God or Fate. Um never really appealed to me too much. Um the others I, I typically can enjoy, but <laughs> versus the God or Fate ones have always just kind of been my least favorite. Sure. Why? Why would? Why would you say that? Or why do you think? Uh, just, I guess, going back and looking at my favorite films, none of them revolve around man versus fate. Okay. Gotcha. Like okay. Star Wars. That's uh, okay. That's a, that's a right. subplot, Gary. <laughs> oh, subplot. Sorry. Sorry. I Wait. thought that was the whole thing Gary, of the six Gary, movies. You're, yeah, you're but there's like part. prophecies and stuff in that in that series as well. So I mean, there's a lot of man versus fate in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, a lot. A lot the good stories, though, mm. I think we can all agree, the good stories have a lot of antagonists. Yeah. Just because yeah. it's one one story doesn't have to have one antagonist. Mm-hmm. It can have five. It can have twenty. You know, um, there's no there's no limit. Uh, Jacob, what about you? <laughs> Uh, mine would probably be man versus man, um, mostly because okay. there there is so much of really? man versus man. Uh, well, it completely okay. it can, it just completely depends on the story. Like I love the Bond series, sure. right? But like more like probably three quarters of those villains you could just throw away. And so there's like there's okay. like God like twenty hours of uh, movies I don't really care to rewatch. While you have the great ones in there, like uh, like Goldfinger <laughs> or Alec Trevelyan. Uh, from GoldenEye. Um, those are the man versus man stories I like to watch, but then you'll have like four or five Bond movies in between with a boring villain. And there's really no introspective um, look at Bond himself until like the Daniel Craig movies. Like Skyfall is all about getting older and possibly losing your edge. And like, what what am I supposed to do as, as Bond from here on out? And then uh, Silva's a pretty all, all right villain uh, a little too much uh joker dark knight for my taste but mm-hmm. it's just it's more over that there are so many like bad man versus man movies and there are good in a lot of ways like the ones that stick out really stick out like uh like amy dune in gone girl like oh, excellent God, yeah excellent mm-hmm. villain 
uh, one of my another one of my favorites, uh, Li Wu Jin in Old Boy. I don't know if y'all have seen Old Boy, yeah. but like right. probably, probably the most patient villain of all time. Literally waited like what 15, 20 years to actually enact a couple decades. His, yeah, enact his revenge. Same with uh, even in like there's a lot of throwaway villains in the Marvel movies, but um, oh god, uh, Civil War. Uh, uh, Baron is a Baron von Strucker. Uh, uh, oh god, I don't remember. They brought Bucky back. Uh, yeah, well, or not? Oh no, 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 not, no. not Strucker. Um, oh god, what's his name? Now I gotta look it up. Uh, but the main villain in Civil War, like he, after the Avengers had uh, basically destroyed that city in Age of Ultron, his family was killed, and then slowly he's been like basically disassembling the Avengers from the inside out over the right. course of like a few years until finally at the end of civil war he fulfilled his mission he won like he destroyed the avengers like he turned yeah. iron man against uh captain america and like that's this kind of stuff i love of course he went through it some like the most nonsensical means like uh, like wearing a bucky mask and like framing bucky in in the weirdest way possible but he still won um whenever you get those kind of villains it's excellent but then you'll just get like the random ass like elf villains in dark world or uh right or there's, mickey rourke in iron man 2 which is like okay you got mickey yeah. rourke can you do something interesting with him it's just there's so much more bad man versus man than there is good right uh, helmut zemo by the way was the was the yes one yes zemo War. Yeah. yes no it's i mean it, it it's agreed yeah and i'm and back to gary's original statement yeah has has hollywood have they gotten lazier with the antagonists or are they just i mean are they are they hellbent on making every movie with multiple antagonists so there's not one antagonist that stands out amongst the rest because if we look at a lot of films nowadays yeah there there's more than just one antagonist or one antagonizing feature mm -hmm. you know in the plot line itself um so yeah no i mean i yeah i think over the last decade yeah you're right not even not even just with you know superhero movies but i think across every genre um you know you're looking at you're looking at a, a pretty low bar to to jump over honestly uh, for myself, um, yeah, Gary, what you, sir? The, uh, it's really tough because it really depends on how you tell the story. Um, so, like, it's tough to pick one of these. I agree with everyone. Um, I, I would say, personally, for myself, it'd be man versus nature because least favorite. Okay. Yeah, it would be my least favorite. Um, I, again, it's really hard to say that because there's a lot of really, really good ones out there. But I it doesn't I, mean you hate it. It's just right, your least I, favorite. I. I really enjoy the stories where there's like two opposing viewpoints um, and they're both not necessarily right and they're both not necessarily wrong and with man versus nature you typically you won't have that because it's just either um, you know like in twister you know the the mm. the the twisters eh? um, or in like castaway it's the setting that they're put in um, and they've got to overcome that but that is very interesting in a lot of ways, but to me, of the five, that would be the least interesting. Okay, yeah, um, and it would, that, that's funny that we all that we all pick something different. I thought we were gonna have a, a couple samesies, identical picks, but it just shows that if you tune in to I don't give a flick, you'll always get the most various answers possible. Yes, all of them are guaranteed correct. Every single one of them. Every single thing we None say. None more important than the other. Exactly. God. I found that I sound like a socialist regi a regime right now. Yes. I mean, Which I wasn't going to say it, but... <laughs> but you were thinking it, though. And it's okay if you want to say it. I'm also bother. thinking people need to go watch that. Crimson Tide. Just saying. Oh, yeah. True. Thank, thank you. There you thank go. You Crimson Tide is a right shit. Point. I do have to say, it's, it's been probably about 15 years since I've seen it. It's, um, um, it's <laughs> the most... We'll do a whole podcast on it. No, just We're kidding. Not gonna talk. But, uh, <laughs> Crimson Tide. I, I love Crimson Tide because it's such a. It's like the most tense movie I've ever seen. It, maybe Uncut Gems uh, would be more tense, but a completely different <laughs> way. But Crimson Tide is so tense, and there's not really that much action in it. But like, it's just uh, the of uh, the battle of the wills and the the thinking, and oh, oh it's so good. Okay. So I, I really wanted to, I was just curious, um, for a lot of our, for, for a lot of the, um, what we consider 
quantitative data, we will typically take Gary and I will, when we do like we've done a list of best actors of all mm. time, uh, most overrated directors, underrated directors, favorite directors, blah, 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 yada, yada. And we'll take lists, obviously, from we'll do uh, we'll we'll do Rotten Tomatoes, uh, AFI, IMDb, and then some indie wire. We'll do some smaller ones, too. Um, but I, I was just I, we were talking and I was just surfing the Web and I, I did come across AFI's uh, list of top heroes and top villains in particular. So I wanted to read off the top 10 list and I want you guys to tell me if you completely agree with it or if you think they're severely lacking and they're stuck back in the golden era of Hollywood or even, you know, prior 2000. So uh, number one, which I think is going to be on a lot of people's list, is Hannibal Lecter. OK, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, number two was Norman Bates from Psycho, uh, the original in 1960. Number three, uh, Darth Vader, okay, uh, from the Star Wars trilogy, uh, or, God, just the series in general. Uh, number four was The Wicked Witch of the West, Wizard of Oz. Alphaba. Uh, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you're a fan of Wicked. Number five was Nurse Ratched uh, from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's <laughs> Nest, who, actually, I, I should have mentioned that one. Love that one. Uh, love this one. Number six, Mr. Potter, uh, who is uh, it's, a wonderful life. it's a Wonderful Life. Seven was Alex Forrest in Fatal Attraction. Um, I have not seen Fatal Attraction in a long time, so I don't recall who that was. Of course, I don't really recall much of the movie. So it's and Michael, Michael Douglas, Douglas and, and Glenn Close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think he's that like, was Glenn Close. He sleeps with the boss or something. And no, you, that's or, um, disclosure. You're thinking of uh, okay. Fatal Attraction. It was his. Um, was that his? Was that even his secretary? It may have just been another woman. I may just maybe got a colleague or something. Mm. I saw a Family Guy parody of it. Oh, isn't, weeks ago. It, isn't he having an affair with her, with Glenn Close, and then he tries to break it off, and then she comes after him? That sounds right. about that sounds to, about right. Uh, to put it mildly, yeah. I mean, we're talking like Bunny in the Pot, like crazy. Oh God. Um, anyway, so uh, we also had Phyllis Dietrichson from Double Indemnity. Okay, from 1944. Never even heard of that movie. Um, number nine was Reagan McNeil, um, who was uh, possessed by the demon Pazuzu, and the demon that talks in the Exorcist. That's, that's, that, that's interesting. They they gave they put her name up and not Pazuzu. I, I I mean the actor the act yeah I, I don't well, know yeah I, I don't think they named the, Pazuzu until uh, Exorcist three. Really. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. It, yeah, because in the in the original Exorcist, they just referred to, like even Pazuzu or Reagan even says like I'm the devil, but doesn't actually name uh, itself. Yeah. It's not it, until it just, right. Yeah, it just seems unfair to me that you know she would get the title for that um, when she's actually not trying to be mean or evil. Yeah. Uh, and so number ten then was. I guess surprisingly, uh, the evil queen from the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves cartoon one from 1937, um, the Disney's first actual full length feature. Um, so I guess from that top 10, there's some in here that I, I, I see and I'm like, oh, obviously that's that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I would consider them to be not only villains, but also some of the better antagonists to have ever been written mm -hmm. um, from that list. Are you guys? Are you surprised to see anybody on there or are, is there any character or element or monster or demon or whatever that you were surprised to not see on there? I mean, I, I agree with most of the list. Uh, I myself, I haven't seen, I don't think I ever saw Fatal Attraction or Double Indemnity. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the white, I guess. Uh, I am surprised that, uh, I mean, obviously, if you're going to just list villains, you have to have the best villain of all time, which is Uber. Which is, so, oh, absolutely. I'm so, I'm actually I'm I looked at I looked at probably three or four lists today just for reference, and Hans Gruber was on all of them. AFI is the only one that didn't have them. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, it's ridiculous. But yeah, for the most part, I, I would I would say that's a pretty solid list. Okay, Jacob, what about you? Uh, let's see. So, quick correction. I think. I have to rewatch Exorcist, but uh, uh -huh. they do name Pazuzu in the uh, Wikipedia synopsis for the film. I just don't okay. remember them actually ever saying its that, name. Yeah. Just a quick correction. They'll do that a lot, though. Once, even if it's years after it's been made, if they've corrected it, they'll go back to the original page the story originated from, and they'll they'll switch everything around. Yeah, uh, but yeah, like uh, like Neil, I've never like. I think I've seen Fatal Attraction when I was a kid a long time ago. I've never seen Double Double Indemnity. Yeah, I never um, heard of it. 
but the rest I think are pretty on point. I think Mr. Potter is a great villain, but I don't think I'd put him in number 10. Um, I'd probably put Maleficent over the evil queen in Snow White. Um, Absolutely. Or uh, any other Disney villain that's memorable outside of, I mean, what about Ursula? Ursula? What about Ursula? Thank you. Scar. Like, yeah. eh, can't, any, yeah. any, anybody else? Cruella Geppetto. DeVille. You know, who? Geppetto. <laughs> like the whale, anime. Jiminy the whale. Cricket. <laughs> that son of a bitch <laughs> stole that kid's childhood. Hopping around, <laughs> trying to cause happiness for everybody. What a dick. Um, yeah, you know, I, I was a little surprised to not see um, who's actually surprisingly two of them being on this list, but not in the top ten. Um, Hal Nine Thousand, yeah, from two thousand one. Two thousand one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would expect him to be higher. Yeah, and uh, and honestly, I would have. They actually had these two in the top twenty, but I'm surprised they weren't in the top ten. They had the alien from the Alien series, um, and then uh, Bruce or the shark from Jaws. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you just talk about iconic. So I, I guess the qu- I, I, like, I guess the question is: Are we talking about like iconic antagonists or the antagonists that are the best antagonists? Because I think that's going to be two different lists. Like Jaws, yeah, sure. that's uh, like the shark is is great and wonderful, but that's not the antagonism that I remember from the movie. I guess that that's not the number one that stands out to me. You know, it's okay. not uh, so. I guess my list, it depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about like iconic, yeah. you know, villains, sure. then, you know, that list may be more accurate, but you know, I, I don't know if I'd say that was my top 10 list for just total antagonists. Yeah. I, I, I would, ha- I would probably have to, I, like I said, I haven't seen double indemnity at all. Uh, it's been so, 20 years since I've seen Fatal Attraction or 15 at this point. Um, and I would not choose the evil queen out of, honestly, I, I wouldn't choose, I wouldn't choose the Pazuzu demon and stuff. I think there are more, maybe it's just, I'm subject, it's subjective because I've seen so many demonic possession movies from the last 30 years that were not the exorcist. Yeah. Um, I see Jack Torrance mm-hmm. here and I think Jack Torrance probably would, right. Should replace Reagan. Yeah. yeah it's obviously Jack Nicholson from the shining. Yeah. And I, I mean, the number one actor of all time. Yeah. I mean, according to our algorithm yes. and the, uh, that we put set together, Jack Nicholson is number one. Oh, yeah, um, and even Travis Pickle from Taxi Driver would have been a great one. Right. Um, so, yeah. Doc I mean, Brown. I, did, you, did you say Doc Brown? Yeah. <laughs> Doc Brown? <laughs> he created the whole timeline no, paradox. He tried to destroy the universe. Trying to get Marty to fuck a, his mom. You're yeah, sick. He's a, he's a <laughs> sick You're such fuck. a shitster, dude. Get the hell out of here. Biff is the only, well, there's multiple antagonists in that series, but get out of here. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. This this was, this was list in particular, AFIs, um, it was really the one that I didn't agree with the most. I agreed with it the least. Um, so I was just curious on, on y'all's take outside of number one and number three. I thought the placing for a lot of them were different. But unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go yes. through a, a top ten list of no. our favorite antagonists of all time. That will be for another podcast. Uh, we are all out of time today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I know it's sad and, yes. and everybody wants... A, a very good discussion, I think. It was. Had. It was. I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, maybe you guys should come back for our next one, which we'll be recording uh, very soon. Very, very soon. Maybe in the next couple minutes. We'll see. Who knows? But, maybe uh, we'll do that. Maybe we won't. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but uh, do you find gentlemen who joined us today have any movie recommendations for our eager audience? <laughs> preferably, yeah, preferably something that had a, a really maybe solid a submarine antagonist. in it. A submarine in it. An antagonistic submarine <laughs> <laughs> in an antagonistic ocean. <laughs> I mean, I can't recommend Crimson Tide enough, so that's going to be my recommendation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect. That's uh, but if you want something other than Crimson Tide, which with a good antagonist, I always thought uh, Event Horizon was a very good, mm. well-made film with yep. very good psychological <sighs> antagonist. A man after my own heart. <laughs> I did like Event Horizon. Everyone told me it was scarier than hell. And they were just like, oh, it's going to scare the crap out of you. It didn't scare the crap out of me. It's no, good no, yeah. no. It, I, 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 I enjoy that movie a lot. I Yeah. Mostly just, uh, I think it was probably Paul W.S. Anderson's, probably his best movie besides Death Race. But yeah, I, I adore that movie. And apparently I there like was movie. like a director's cut that makes that movie even more intense. But really? I think the third act is where it kind of falls apart because they put in the uh, those stock like punch effects whenever uh, Sam Neill right. punching about Lawrence Fishburne. And it's just like, whoosh, 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 whoosh. 
And it's like, okay, <laughs> this is too cheesy now. But it, right. a movie I enjoyed, I mean, gave me Dead Space and uh, yeah. influenced a lot of like space horror since then. I mean, not not only Alien did that, but I feel like Event Horizon did that for video games in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so yeah, no, yeah, Neil, that's a that's a fan, two fantastic picks. So Jacob, I don't know how you're going to top that, but what's your recommendation this week? Uh, I won't because I personally love Event Horizon, but I just recently <laughs> watched uh, The Wailing. Um, it's a, a southern, uh, it's a South Korean horror movie uh, directed by uh, Na Hong Jin, and basically it's about like a uh, sort of. Oh, man, it's it's hard to describe. It's basically kind of a ghost story haunting of a, a South Korean village, uh, but it also includes like a bunch of xenophobia because uh, apparently because during this time a um, a Japanese fisherman moves into the village, but since he's moved in, all these people have been like going crazy and there have been murders happening. Uh, there's right. like, a strange infection, and so the xenophobia of uh, the Koreans think it's Japanese. So the movie kind of try to tries to pivot you back and forth as to who the real villain actually is. And so like the, the entire third act, like it kept me guessing. Cause I was like, I don't know who the villain's going to be. Cause I'm assuming the villain's going to be just this other ghost or something like that. But uh, it plays with you a lot. And uh, I just thought it was really hmm. excellently directed uh, the way it plays with its characters and it's in its tone too. Like the tone in the beginning feels very much like Shaun of the dead ish. Uh, it's kind of really? kind of comical because the main character is very incompetent and uh, funny and dorky in a lot of ways. But then when the movie hits its stride, it just gets super serious and super dark, and it goes places I didn't think it would. I mean, if 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 that's another South Korean product on the same level as Bong Joon Ho, then or Bong Joon Ho, then I mean, I, I probably will see it. Where did, was it on Netflix or where is it streaming? Uh, I watched it on Shutter. You watch on Shutter, okay? Yeah, you've you've been watching a lot on Shutter. What what uh, what type of uh, monthly subscription is that? Is that like fifteen uh, bucks a month? Is it ten? I think it? it's fifteen. Oh no, it's it's I think it's five dollars a month, uh, but it's sixty for a year. So I went ahead okay. and paid the full sixty. And is it just is it just psychological thrillers and horrors as the title of the network might suggest, or is it all movies in general? No, it's it's mostly dedicated to thrillers and horror movies. Um, okay. There's TV shows in there. Uh, they've got like a few, like some of it's like, I mean, they'll have comedies in there, but they usually revolve around horror stuff like that, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of a lot of good movies in there, and of course like the bad ones because you got to have bad horror movies. Absolutely, you have to. Uh, you have to. Uh, all right, guys. Anyways, uh, from all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick, thanks for tuning in this week. Uh, once again, thank you to uh, Neil and Jacob for joining us. Uh, hopefully you guys can be back very soon, maybe for the next podcast. Maybe. Ooh. Which may, may be recording in a second. Mayhaps. I remember doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, and anyways, uh, I'm Johnny Blackburn. And I'm Gary Elmore. Stay classy. And we're clear. No one says that anymore.